functional of the input uh, it, uh, as its input and producing output. If you take a look at one line of lily pond uh, notes, we see here is a pitch. It's the Eingeschritten C, uh, C, uh, uh, middle C, it's called. Uh, then we have two pitches here, C and E, combined in a chord. And the chord has a length of a quarter note with a dot. Those are the filled note heads. And uh, the, the then we have six notes, two, one after another. And they are combined with a slur. So we have a textual representation that musicians that know note names are more or less comfortable with and we get the printed representation that looks uh, like this. Obviously, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's probably uh, not as much as writing latex text but rather like writing formulas where the where you really have to develop a feeling for how things will look at, at the end. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I explained all uh, those features there are, yeah, it's, it's, it's pitch uh, is, is a note name, C, E, D, you, uh, C sharp is called uh, CIS, uh, C, I, U, S. Uh, the, the note names here are the Dutch note names, which are basically the same as German uh, note names, except that uh, the Dutch call uh, B flat uh, Bess, whereas the uh, Germans call B flat B and call B H. Uh, and uh, so, so there is a slight difference in note names, but uh, you wouldn't be able to tell that these are the German ones. There are also uh, other uh, note name languages, but uh, let's not talk about them. If we take a look uh, at how Steam which is the internal language, or sort of the internal language of uh, Lily Pond represents the stuff, uh, then it has one make music call of sequential music. Sequential music are the uh, braces here, which uh, say, okay, play this one after another, not at the same time. And uh, then it has elements, and the elements are a list consisting of the chord, uh, which is uh, this one, and the chord uh, then has two note uh, events in it, the two notes here, which each have a duration, uh, the numbers are uh, a bit complex, and the pitch, and you can call them in that way, and uh, so, so you can equivalently uh, to that write this in Scheme and get the same result. Obviously, a musician wouldn't want to do that, but uh, it's interesting that, as a programmer, you can juggle with those entities. Okay, uh, I, uh, since I've had a rather, yeah, it's a sort of a uh, tough simulation that I'm uh, doing because I have to go through very quickly, I have a score example here. And uh, there will be a task afterwards. Uh, you can see here are uh, uh, two uh, yeah, violin one and two. Fortunately, they are playing the same voice, a continual voice, which is used to a, a double bass, and uh, an alto voice. And uh, now I have to have transportable equipment. So all I am having with me is this thing. And uh, if you can say, okay. We can get there with this thing. Uh, one can say one can get there pretty far because, uh, well, the, the violin one is something like that. And if I take a second violin, they are not quite in tune. Uh, that's the way an accordion sounds like two violins that are out of tune. And uh, the continual voice then would be the, uh, the bass is. Uh, so I, w one can simulate uh, having this whole setup, uh, but the problem is uh, the notes here are bass notes, and if you have a small accordion like that, usually uh, uh, an accordion player does not know how to play bass notes because uh, they only have 12 notes here. 
and uh, there is only one C, one D, uh, every of the 12 nodes is only there once. Uh, the buttons are ordered in a strange manner. Uh, uh, if I have here one button, the next button is... Uh, it's uh, very handy for doing simple accompaniments like... I, I need a square centimeter for that accompaniment, but uh, it's not so good for playing a, a melody. And uh, accordion players just know how to read rhythm when they see notes. And they need chord letters that uh, indicate what button is going to be pressed. Because uh, the C button uh, is one with, uh, that's specially marked, you can feel it. And the next one is the G, and uh, yeah, they know the names of the chords, but they don't know uh, how to read them in notes. So we are creating a special engraver. Uh, I'm running through here very fast uh, again. Uh, just to demonstrate how one does complex tasks using Scheme inside of Lillipond. Uh, not not to, to explain completely, but just give an impression. And there is an engraver, is a thing which sits in the back end of Lillipond and which converts events, uh, like nodes, into something visual. And uh, we create an engraver that picks off a note when it is being played, uh, or when it is being uh, engraved picks out its details, generates a letter from it, and then places an accent on uh, the note. Um, as I said, I'm just running through here to get uh, more a bit of impression. So that's an actual task uh, which one does with internal programming, because uh, note name, uh, this task, there is no pre-configured solution for that. And if we now see what happens <coughs> with the base notes, they all get annotated with additional note names and uh, then usually uh, the accordion player can play it. So it's an... Yeah. Uh, something like that. And uh, uh, so, so if we put it back in here, we, we can indeed see uh, there are playable notes coming out. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simulation basically, because it's not an orchestra, what one has here, but... Now. 
see I have to simulate the alto voice as well. <laughs> It's the best one can do with, with that sort of equipment. So that was the practical application. And uh, now we're coming more into the details. How does this sort of integration that Lilicon has with its own extension language, namely Scheme, uh, compared to that we have with LuaTeX, which has Lua as its extension, uh, extension language. And we take a closer look at the Scheme language. And uh, Scheme is notable for having parents. I, I mean, uh, if, if, uh, if you are afraid of parents or have some, uh, yeah, uh, so, some hate against parents, then uh, Scheme is probably a problematic language for you because everything in Scheme uh, is built from lists and uh, it's, it's sort of uh, one of Scheme's parents was uh, a language called Lisp, which is short for Lisp Processing. And so the Lisp is a very, very uh, important element in Scheme. Uh, um, expression uh, is usually built by making a list from a function call, in this case plus, and arguments. So if I call plus two, three, and evaluate this in scheme. Uh, first I read it, then it's a list consisting of a function and two numbers. And if I evaluate this list, uh, then I get a result. So that's the five. Uh, list also has macros. And uh, macros are a very simple concept, uh, like we uh, have, uh, I mean, you know, probably, uh, languages with uh, preprocessor like C has as its preprocessor a special program that does uh, juggling with lexical entities before you start uh, the actual compiler. And uh, Tech has its mouth as sort of a preprocessor which it starts before doing anything serious. So Lisp has macros and uh, those are actually very simple. They are just the same as normal functions. The only difference is uh, macros get their arguments unevaluated <coughs> and uh, are free to do juggle with them before they are evaluated and whatever the macro returns is then afterwards evaluated. And so, so you just have a slight shift in the order eval uh, of evaluation but otherwise you don't have a complete separate system, a complete separate preprocessor that works differently and that's pretty convenient. Then you can use quoting when you don't want something evaluated, which is pretty important inside of macros, uh, because uh, they, they want to return something that's evaluated afterwards. If I use a back quote, that means please don't evaluate anything from the following expression. And the expression, again, is what happens to have the same number of opening and closing parentheses, except for those with special Oh, okay, you can evaluate this operators before them, which are comma and comma at. Uh, yeah, and if we take a look what happens if we evaluate this list, it remains a list because the list itself is quoted, so we have the same parents. All the first part of the list is still quoted, then comes here an element, please evaluate this. So. We don't have plus one, two here, but we have a three. And uh, then we have then please evaluate this and append it here. And what is supposed to be evaluated and appended is directly quoted again. So it is uh, plus one and two are appended. So not as a separate list, but inside of the list. That's a so-called list splicing operator. So that was... Uh, those are det details of the language which are really, uh, that, that's as hard as it gets. <laughs> so even if it's uh, now hard to understand, uh, it's pretty easy to get into it. Uh, for expressions and uh, statements, many languages have make a difference between expressions and statements. Lisp doesn't. 
uh, it's for, for one of the reason one calls it a functional uh, language. The the other reason is that functional is more or less uh, says lots of parentheses and uh, yeah. And if we take a look at such a statement uh, here, we have if <coughs> smaller two than three. So again, the, the operators are all in front because uh, there are also no operators. Everything is a function call. Then return the addition of five and seven, else return the eight. And we see that two is less than three indeed, and so we get <coughs> 12 here as a return uh, result. So that's basically the syntax of uh, Lisp uh, in a nutshell. And uh, I mean, the Lua syntax is impressive because the syntax diagram fits on one such page. And uh, that, that's really nice for a syntax. Uh, Scheme doesn't even have a syntax. <laughs> it just reads uh, lists and evaluates them. And so uh, there is no such thing as a syntax diagram you would need to learn. If we take a look how this scheme is embedded into Lillipond, we have a gateway from Lillipond to scheme. If we are in the Lillipond language and want to call scheme, uh, we use a hash character or a dollar character in order to call the scheme. Uh, this character is the, uh, I'll demonstrate this soon, and if we are in scheme, oh, uh, we went back into Lillipond, uh, that's a problem if you're doing the slides too fast, uh, then we have the hash grace operator inside of which uh, we can write things in Lillipond syntax, and they are then interpreted or returned into scheme. I can probably, uh, that's uh, probably uh, uh, a note in between, uh, just well, because I have it on screen, as Lillipond used to use tech as its uh, typesetting backend, but it does not yeah. uh, anymore, so there is uh, no reason not to be able to work with the uh, Unicode, as you can see here, this is the Japanese <coughs> application of Lillipond. Uh, there is no Polish, actually. Uh, a translator would obviously have, yeah, be useful for a lot of people if somebody decided to work on Polish translations. Uh, there's an English version as well, so you don't need uh, need to hear. Uh, on a German version, but the German version is lagging I think about three months behind by now. Uh, what I wanted to say is Unicode is supported inside of Lillipond and is working uh, without any problems. And uh, you can use uh, non-standard characters even in uh, lyrics to music and you can use it in running text. Don't ask me about, uh, about right to left uh, languages because I, I don't have a good answer for those. <coughs> but uh, they are pretty hard to do in music anyway. I think the, or what the Hebrews sometimes do, either you do every syllable from right to left, but types at the music left to right, which is, takes getting used to, or they just mirror the, the complete uh, uh, music, so um, they also write the music with uh, mirrored symbols from right to, to left and then put the lyrics below, but that Lillipond can't do yet. It's on the list of things people want to have at some point of day, so uh, point of time. Okay. What is the translation of Lillipond? What, okay, that was the translated documentation, but which parts of Lillipond get translated? Uh, trans uh, the manuals get a translation. Uh, all the uh, input and output from the uh, command console get translated so that if you're uh, having your... Sorry, this is an error. Like yeah, yeah, right. Uh, all those get translated as well, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean... Uh, I, I mean... Uh, uh, translated error messages make me bonkers, so my uh, uh, system is set up uh, in English, but 
uh, basically it is completely uh, internationalized. But the, when one writes music, uh, <coughs> are there like some comments? I, I forgot most of them. It's like, um, this user enter Japanese. I wasn't sure what that was, but is that like back, like in backslash begin document, the equivalent of that? Is this also translated? I don't know how oh, it is. Really uh, you you mean the command that. names? No, yeah. the command names stay the same, uh, but yeah, the command names stay in English, they are not translated. Uh, what you can uh, do is change the note names. There are, I think, uh, Dutch, German, Italian, uh, uh, Italian, French, I think, are the same, yeah. possibly, um, yeah. and, uh, and English note names as well. And so uh, you have to switch them explicitly. Uh, they are not switched uh, depending on your uh, lo locality. Yeah. yeah, so, so generally, uh, Lillipond uh, does not look at the locale for anything uh, it uses for interpreting its files, uh, but it uh, looks at the locale for talking on the terminal. And, uh, I would rather ask you not, not to go on with, with the things which uh, sidetrack you. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, those were merely the important things. Uh, uh, I should get back to the interesting ones. Um, <coughs> So if, uh, if I open li a Lillipond interpreter and I, I can ask it to, oh, probably nobody can read that, right? Um, how does when? Uh, yep, something better or is this a, uh, I, I can give it another kick and then, <coughs> okay. Uh, I get now the command line interpreter and I'm, I'm now inside of Lily Pond and I can ask it what would the C look like and it returns then a printed representation of, uh, of the uh, pitch that's in there and I can also take a look at what uh, yeah, so the sort of input I had before C4 G and uh, yeah, and now it gets less handy. There is a special display music operator which again converts this into a more readable form. But basically, you you are right uh, in the engine there, and you can test what does an expression look like. Or <coughs> what is it? So that was the the gateway from Scheme to Lillipond. Uh, both gateways, as as one has seen, pass values. You you can. If you have a scheme expression inside of Lillipond, you can use its value in your Lillipond expression and vice versa. Uh, there are several operators. Oh, that was one too much. Yeah. And uh, with slight differences, I won't go into the details right now. And uh, I now do a sort of a heavy handed example uh, that just shows how much I can integrate. Uh, the concepts of scheme with a Lillipond file. And there uh, it starts with a hash that means, okay, go into scheme, I want to define something in scheme. It defines a macro called pattern. The macro uh, returns a music function, which is a command for Lillipond. And uh, on the fly, uh, I, I, it's a functional language. So uh, the usage of this thing, which I'll explain in detail, is I say uh, a dollar, then pattern, and the pattern gets parameters, which are A, B, C, D here, and expands them into A, B, D, A, C, uh, and gets a list how these patterns should be arranged. And if I now put four patterns behind it, I see that indeed the order I get here is A, B, D, A, C, D. So the, uh, this pattern operator, I mean often music has some sort of pattern form, uh, does just that. And now we take a look how does this strange interaction between Lillipond and Scheme actually work. <coughs> and if we take a look at 
what happens if we are now looking inside of scheme. We have this definition of the macro and we have the call of the pattern with those parameters. So what happens when we call the macro? First step is pretty easy. We just take a look. The pattern has <coughs> arguments and the result expression. The arguments are this here. The result is this. We fit this into this definition here, uh, adding <coughs> sufficient quotes because those are not evaluated when pattern sees them. <coughs> and so the, uh, yeah, this, this is a mechanical substitution. And if we actually evaluate this expression, which is a quoted expression, we get out this. Basically, everything <coughs> inside that is not preceded by a comma stays. So we have the defined music function here. We have the parser location, which is black magic. Uh, you will learn to just use and not uh, ask about. Uh, then we have the splicing, list splicing operator here, which splices the ABCD into this place. Then we have a call of make list, which takes a look at how many parameters were there in our list and makes a list with the length and the content uh, li dot punkt music question mark uh, which is this list which appears here. So what is that supposed to be? The define music function uh, defines a function we can use inside of Lillipond not in scheme, but really inside of Lillipond, uh, and uh, which needs to know, because Lillipond is a language with a syntax, what kind of arguments will it be getting. And so, for the four arguments, we have to say every argument satisfies the predicate, it's a music expression, because this function gets four music expressions. Okay, so it gets those four music expressions, then we get the list splice in here, at uh, that point of time, the parameter uh, result gets spliced into this expression, and here's the end of the hash mark. And if we take a look uh, what will happen when this gets inter interpreted, this part, uh, then we have here the list with six elements coming from there, and they are spliced back into Lillipond, so that we have this six arguments, uh, the six instances of the four function arguments which are getting into Lillipond and interpreted there. So, now, the thing is, this looked complicated, but the real question is, why the heck does it even work? Uh, because if, uh, if we are switching between interpreters, what we have here is a reference <coughs> to stuff that's only known to, to Scheme. And when we're calling uh, an instance of Scheme inside of Lillipond, how does this instant of Scheme, which is called with a dollar here, inside of the Lillipond, which is called here, know what the heck even result is supposed to be? Uh, and the answer to that is lexical closure, but it's a half answer because macros expand at a different time than actual uh, work gets done. And if we take it now a look at the scheme sandbox and ask, what are you doing? And we are, are expanding this, uh, this macro, uh, then what we get out is actually uh, the define music function, this part is as we expected it, but it turns out that the hash mark with the integrated Lillipond part <coughs> gets turned into a procedure which gets a parser, a string, a filing, a line, and closures as information. Parser is what knows how to interpret Lillipond. And uh, the parser that is used here is the one that is going to be active when you call this macro. Uh, then we have, yeah, this, this procedure gets this parser. It gets as a string 
just as a simple quoted stream, all the content of this environment, and uh, it gets information, file name and line. Why does it need those? The file name here is because I entered this from the command line, is, M, uh, is false, and the uh, line was the third line of entry. And uh, it needs those actually if there's an error. If there's an error, you get an error message and it says, okay, uh, error occurred on line so-and-so and, -so and uh, file so-and-so. And so the parser, to, in order to deliver proper error messages, should know where this string is actually coming from so that it cannot just say, I have an error in a string and I don't know where it's from, but that it can say it's in this file uh, where this hash mark uh, race was. Uh, <coughs> yeah. is, is the author of the music or the composer supposed to write this kind of stuff when he wants to record his music? In uh, no, actually, uh, I'm afraid that's an important bit, but not interesting. Uh, so the author of the music is not supposed to know this, but uh, but Taco is supposed to know it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, because we're, talk, we're comparing the extension languages. And so this, this heavy duty stuff, it's, it's for interest, but uh, I can assure you it's, 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 not in, uh, yeah, for in, uh, it's not the interesting part, actually. It's, uh, it's the important part, namely, what kind of integration do we have here that we'd want in LuaTech as well, or in a similar way in, in the equivalent. And the thing is here, the languages are intertwined so tightly that you don't even notice anything unusual, which is good for the user of the program, and uh, which makes this important but not interesting, uh, because you don't need to know it. Uh, but in the context of the talk, namely of how good can you integrate an extension language uh, with a language of its own, it's, I call it interesting. <laughs> well, maybe it's only important. Um, and if we take a look at, uh, okay, the, so it, it's clear that there was hap uh, something happening behind the scenes. And if we're taking now a look at the primitives, the actual primitives that are doing this kind of thing, there are some uh, some stuff written in C++ uh, that can parse the string expression and gets the file name and the line, the information that we just saw uh, a minute ago, and there is something that can clone a parser and provide it with information about variables that should be active when a scheme is being called. And if we take a look at this last argument. This last argument actually from the macro expansion contains an offset into the string. Let me parse the string very, very, very roughly and said, oh, there's a dollar. There's something that I will at a later point of time need to know something about and that's related to my current environment and scheme. So it appends the two as the offset and wraps the expression into an anonymous function. It can call at a later time. And this anonymous function will know about those variables because it's defined inside of this defined music function. So by roughly parsing the contents of the stuff and just picking out every potential scheme expression that might at a later time be evaluated, the information is there that is needed to actually tie the things into each other. And that was when you get a new parser, you can tell it, okay, I have this sort of information about embedded scheme process, uh, expressions that if you want to evaluate them, you can just call this function and it will do just what should be happening inside of Scheme. If we now take a look at the integration that is offered for Lua Tech and Lua, uh, then we have, for one thing, a quite different language. Tech has different systems for macro expansion and execution. They are called mouth and stomach. 
then we have a primitive that's called direct lure. Direct lure works in the mouth. Inside of lure, you can use tech.print uh, to spit strings back from lure into the mouth. Uh, there is actually no command for connecting the stomach uh, with lure, but you can define one by just wrapping your direct lure inside of a protected macro, which means it only gets expanded as a last resort if it's protected. So if you do that, then it works more or less in the stomach and spools back into the mouth with tech.print if you want to, at a point of time when uh, tech actually is ready for seeing something. And there's also late lua. Late lua is actually not working in the stomach, but is working behind it. Uh, this anatomy it doesn't have a proper tech name, I think. That analog generally doesn't work as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's working during ship out, so it's, it's rather late and uh, you usually don't want to spit anything back into the mouth at that point of time. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, the, the point is uh, you don't have this interchange of parsers that uh, characterizes the integration of Lillipond and Lua, but uh, you rather have more or less independent uh, yeah, jobs that can provide input to the respective other universe, but the, inter uh, the input is merely text. It's not, uh, it's not a data structure. With one exception, uh, Lua has access to text stomach and can, yeah, can do stomach surgery without telling text. So you can manipulate the tech variables uh, in their current state from Lua uh, and in the current grouping of tech, the grouping of uh, tech and the group scoping of Lua are not at all related to each other, so uh, this can lead to interesting results. And the interpretation is not really all that much synchronized or, or uh, coherent, so, so they're you basically have two systems which are not integrated except for the fact that one can call the other uh, to do some uh, thing and the other can operate on the inner, uh, on the stomach of, uh, of the other. I, I mean, uh, sort of like marriage, uh, only completely different. And if, if I now take an example and want to test how, how this integration works and I use the primitive, and uh, by calling direct Lua and from Lua, a direct Lua was printing a command to take. And I find that in order to print the command, I have to have two backslashes. And in order to keep tech from yeah, interpreting the two backslashes that to earlier time, I need a no expand. So uh, this, this combination is, uh, I actually, just to write this example, I, uh, I was about five or ten minutes, I knew what the commands were, but I needed five to ten minutes to get this thing to compile and not throw any errors that were quite strange. <coughs> yeah, so in summary, if we take a look at yes. what kind of language integrations we have uh, between Lillipond and Scheme, uh, then the, the, this kind of in integration that is visible to the user, who, to the person who needs to, uh, who, who at some point of time will need to do some basic programming and uh, will get to get tasks solved and he just writes naively what he thinks should work and the likelihood that what a uh, user naively thinks should work will actually work in Lillipond is, is rather high. The likelihood in Luatec, as you saw with the example before, is not all that high. Part of the reason, of course, is that I work with primitives here, and uh, primitives are just there for providing the theoretic possibility of getting work done. But uh, uh, do we have packages for various formats for context, we have packages that do enable some sort of interaction, but the general deficiency that values can be passed back and forth in a 
nice way will remain. And for uh, LaTeX, at least I don't know of any, which can of course be because I have not been working with it for a long time. Uh, in general, if you take the LuaTeX documentation and try to figure out from it, oh, how can I make good use of LuaTeX, then you arrive at, at a dead end pretty fast as a user which has only basic programming ca uh, capabilities and one advantage of Lua is that it, it as a uh, language is very easy to learn and so uh, that there is no convenient interface which saves you from uh, yeah, getting a dirty nose the first ten times you try to achieve anything is probably a problem. And yeah, that's basically it. Uh, and so I'm probably, hopefully, still in time. Uh, and Thank you very much. If you're unlucky, some of the interesting bits will also be in the proceedings, uh, but uh, I hope to have all the important bits in there so that if you got interested uh, in the details, you will be able to read them up once Yaji sends out the uh, updated proceedings. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now lunch time, but before you leave, uh, we would uh, I would uh, like to have a head, head count for those who from here intend to go to the bookbinding workshop. Who is right? One, two, three, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people. Okay. Uh, uh, you counted me as well? Yes. Okay. So more or less. An impression. How many? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's what we really want.